you want the secret? Here's the secret. You work your ass off for years upon years doing things kind of a slow, unsexy way, but that's what gradually builds up progress over time. I want to be as big as Facebook tomorrow. I want to be as big as my fitness pal tomorrow. I would love that. So today we have Nick Shaw. This is the brain of the giant octopus that's going to take over the world and um, really trigger the apocalypse that Mike was referring to in the last episode with Mike Isretel from Renaissance Periodization. Nick described this episode as going to be the more in-depth but PG version of the <laughs> 18R-rated version um, that, we, that we had a few weeks ago with Mike. Nick, thank you for coming on. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. I would say that's a very accurate description. Um, usually what happens is um, Mike doesn't have a very great filter. And so then I have to usually come on after or in some capacity. Um, I've had, you know, numerous conversations with him. Uh, you know, Mike's great. He's literally the smartest person that I know. And that's not even an overstatement or anything like that. Um, and, you know, he, he sort of loves to, you know, poke the bear, so to speak, when it comes to, you know, saying some things. And I kind of just had to remind him over the years that like, hey, man, I get it. You know, you love to friendly debate and, you know, friendly banter arguments against people. But um, kind of just given today's current climate, it's like you, you almost can't really do that, which I think is a little unfortunate because, right, that's how you really learn is, you know, you get people that might not agree with you. And you can hopefully learn from them because there's probably some middle ground to be formed in there. So, yeah, again, I'm just here for like the PG. I'll call it PG-13 version, maybe, you know. I feel like you're, you're the, so there's a lot of similarity with me and Johnny, for sure, where like I can imagine you're the guy that has to come in like when everyone's like fighting each other and saying racist stuff. Or you're like, guys, guys, <laughs> let's all just sit down, have a nice cup of tea and talk this through like adults. Yeah, something like that. Just, you know, and I've actually, I've learned a ton from Mike, you know, I think on RP plus, he's got like a whole series of videos about arguing to convince and just knowing some basic stuff like that. It's like, man, how much better could the world be if sort of everyone used some of those basic principles? It's like, well, instead of attacking each other, you sort of look for a little common ground because there's probably some common ground unless you're like super crazy on the far sides of anything. It's like most of the time the, the truth is somewhere in the middle. It's usually not super far extremes, but uh, I saw he did fight. that really well with Lyle McDonald um, on the uh, revive stronger podcast where like, I don't think any of us would have the level of tact and diplomacy to find common ground and not get kind of triggered and, and poked by, by those kind of things. So yeah, it's definitely a, an impressive skill. Yeah, Lyle, he's an interesting fellow, really smart guy, just has a really interesting way of, of going about things, which many find to not be enjoyable. You don't want to be on the other side of a, of a debate with someone who's done a series of videos about how to convince someone to do like if like Mike's done something and you're like, okay, I need to convince him here. I'm going up against the guy who has the YouTube series on how to convince someone. How do you convince the, conv the, the, the head of convincing? Well, I don't know. You do a really good job, I guess. And then, and then hopefully, because they, you know, they sort of know the same stuff, they'll sort of, I guess, see that you are presenting good evidence and, you know, being reasonable, rational and stuff. And, and hopefully there's uh, some common ground. Yeah, it's funny, too, because, you know, sometimes um, Mike and I will get into friendly debates and, you know, the same thing happens. I'll be like, hey, like, I understand your point one, two, and three, but I also think we can do, you know, four, five, and six. And he's like, okay, well, that's, you know, probably true. Or he'll just pick, no, that's stupid. And I'm like, well, he didn't really do that too much. But. The, the way that Mike described you was the, the numbers guy of Renaissance periodization, like the, the brains of it. And he is the, almost like he's the front end and you're the back end. And so he said that some of the strategic elements of, RP would be really good to go through with you in terms of the KPIs that you um, that you aim for, your customer focus, and really just your your lifestyle and the lessons that you've learned from going from coach to where you are today. 
Totally. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mike's probably like the quote unquote brains of the operation and, you know, he writes most of the books and designs the products and you know, it's really interesting. So he always made a really good pair because that's probably not my strong suit. Um, but I have kind of the personality where I tend to be really organized and, you know, pretty good at getting stuff done, like making sure things are done on timelines and all that. And so when it comes to sort of running all the operations, it's, it's a good combination because, you know, uh, answering emails, for example, like I'm, I'm always going to be on top of answering emails. It's just like, I can't not do that because it's like, it just, it gets to me. Uh, whereas, you know, like Mike will go three, four days without answering something. I'll literally have to, like, if something's actually really important, I'll just text him. Like, Hey, please go look at this email. Like I need your answer or reply here. Give me your thoughts. And, you know, he'll text me back and then like, I can go ahead and reply. So it's like, you know, done on a pretty, pretty timely, uh, manner but uh, yeah that's it, it works out really well man and it has worked out really well and you know we sort of both know each other's strengths and, and can play off of that and it's been a great partnership so how, how would you sorry that's this is the other problem with zoom that happens all the time <laughs> oh dude how, it's 100 times like an hour. constant yep. how would you describe your role in rp then what do you feel like on a, on a daily basis like what do you spend your time focusing on yeah, well, it's really great. So because it's changed a lot over the years. So if we go back to like 2015 and 2016, I was like, you know, knee deep and having to do everything because we had a really, really small team, like basically my wife and I and like, you know, some RP coaches. And so I was really like just having to do tons of customer service stuff, ton, tons of all this. And then over time, we were able to bring in more people and, you know, start helping with tasks like that. And I guess the one thing that I, I sort of picked up early on was that, you know, there's some stuff that I probably have a pretty good handle on, but if there's something that I just don't know or don't understand very well, I'm going to go outside and like hire a consultant or like hire someone to come in and do that. Because why do I want to try to waste my own time figuring it out and maybe not even do a good job at it where I can just bring someone in that's sort of an expert in that. And again, they're going to, you know, be much more efficient and, and much better at it. So I guess now it's just kind of, um, I almost want to say more of a managerial role now because we've got, you know, a really good team. You know, we've got a great app developer team, you know, someone that like runs marketing, someone that runs operations, uh, et cetera. And so it's just kind of like customer service, of course, is really, really important. And it's just kind of, you know, being in touch with all these different people and just kind of making sure that, you know, the ship is sort of maybe steering in the right direction. So it's, it's been an interesting switch for me uh, because I, I tend to like to be a little bit more hands-on and, and do stuff. So like when other people are, are doing all those tasks, I, I'm almost, you know, finding myself asking, like, what can I do? Like, I need to do something and like trying to think, okay, well, like, where's my time going to be best spent? And so, you know, it's always kind of a, a little battle, um, but yeah, it's good, man. A little bit more of a managerial role now, just staying on top of emails and you know just making sure things are running pretty smoothly and you know hopefully in the right direction it's important it's interesting you mentioned the importance of consulting and deferring expertise to the the experts or to the teams of, of problems that you're trying to solve and really saving yourself a huge amount of time rather than trying to do it all yourself where i mean where do you think you would be if you if you had a kind of oppositional stance towards getting consultants and um, tried to do everything yourself we'd be in like 2016 form <laughs> where we're you know selling selling excel files or whatever which worked out great for you know a couple of years but there's been a pretty cool gradual shift in that over time as well um, but I would probably not have more time to sort of focus on the bigger picture like bigger strategy long-term stuff and I'd be you know uh, I think the traditional phrasing is you're, you're basically just like in the weeds, like you're working in the business, not on the business. And that's sort of that key distinction. And so that's where we would really be. It's just you almost, you can't get ahead when you're doing that. So you have to take a step back a little bit sort of detach from what's going on. And then you can, you know, look around, see the bigger picture and then start to formulate a, a better long-term plan from there. It's funny. Cause that's, yeah, very much the, the problem that I think people don't anticipate facing and, when I'm very similar to you that if my email inbox is piling up, like so is my blood pressure. And actually we, we want to be able to control all aspects of the business because we think that we can deliver the best 
quality and if we outsource it then maybe they won't do quite as good a job and the whole thing of if you want something done well do it yourself and i think that works very much in the initial stage as you said with the 2016 form of rp where you are selling spreadsheets but very quickly you're going to be overtaken by the capacity for scale by other companies that that are willing to leverage themselves and so i think um it's interesting that at stage one of your coaching business you build the infrastructure yourself and you you understand the processes and then you take those individual parts and you hand them out to different teams to be able to do a better job of it while you are at the center of the octopus overseeing everything yeah i would even call the templates like stage two because stage one was really we were only doing online coaching we didn't even have digital products and so then in october of 2014 we came out with our first ebook and that was this sort of mind blowing experience where we were like wow instead of working with a handful of clients personally you know we can create a basically educational informational product and wow like all of a sudden that can help you know a thousand people versus you can only help a handful and it was just like game changer and then that's kind of how we came up with the idea of the templates in the first place we're like well we know all this our coaches are really good but there's only so much you can do and not everyone can afford coaching right so it's like what are sort of the, the best ways to scale and expand? Well, it's to take good information or, you know, good product and sort of make it cheaper and more available to even more people. And then when you can do that, it just really opens up the doors. And so again, that's like when the scaling really took off. And from there, you know, funny story, I used to send out all of our templates uh, manually way back in 2015. I did that for like a few months. And I was like, this is really terrible. Like this is absolutely terrible use of my time. This is stupid. And someone suggested like email automation. I was, you know, highly skeptical, of course. It's just like you said, just unsure if you can like hand something over. And then I did, and it was no coincidence that, you know, like revenue started to go like this because, you know, everything was automated, it was done. And then I had like, you know, literally hours a day to like do more stuff or, you know, uh, work with more clients or reach out to, you know, like, more influencers or do more social media or whatever it was. And it's just like, boy, why wasn't I doing this a lot sooner? And it's just funny because, you know, it's one of those things you just don't know until you know, and you, you experience, it. I mean, you, you can read about all this stuff too. And you can say, okay, yeah, that makes sense. And then like when you really experience it yourself, it's just like, <laughs> what? what an idiot. Yeah. So, we've definitely been there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think I, still, everyone still has. Still yeah. So do you, it sounds like, Nick, that the demand of the business or the performance of the business put you in this position where you're like, we're going to have to do something about this. So you're doing things very manually and by yourself. Then that led to kind of productizing what you were doing, then led to automation, then I assume led to hiring a team, bringing in consultants. Is that the progression? All of us? Yeah, pretty much. Yep. Uh, it was... Yeah, and once the automation was in place, it was like, well, now we need people to, you know, kind of help with this new software. And so, you know, we synced up with people that specialize in that and were able to help, you know, run things more efficiently, more smoothly. And then, you know, because again, it's like you, you automate something and you improve one process, but then it sort of leads to other issues. And, mm. you know, that the automation process was great because then you're able to scale more, but then you have other issues where now you have you know, five, 10 times the number of people purchasing from your site. Well, now you have to deal with a lot more customer service stuff. And, you know, because of the, you know, email automation, I'm sure you guys are probably familiar with this, but you know, not, a lot of times emails don't get through for whatever reason. And again, it just opens up more issues. And so it's like, oh, great. Well, now we have this one problem solved, but now it leads to this new problem. And then you have to kind of solve that. And so it's always, I think, just kind of playing a you know, whack-a-mole, right? Or it's like you fix one thing, but something else comes up and you're just constantly doing I've heard people say that um, the the whole idea of success is not that you're going to eliminate all your problems, but you choose the problems that you're going to have and having yeah. better problems means a better quality of life. And so this whole idea that you described of having throughput with your business where like that you've got the ship and you want to be able to make the ship go faster in general and you fix the leak in one of them, which means the ship goes faster, but then it means that you're getting drag on this side of the ship and it's causing it to turn. And so you then have to solve that problem. And then, and each time you solve one of those problems, some, the next thing comes about. But I suppose that's just identifying the next bottleneck, but each, each stage is a level up and I guess allows you to serve more people in the process. 
Totally right. And I think it goes back to the idea that like anything good and worthwhile is just going to take some work and you know, it's not meant to be easy, right? If it was easy, everyone would be, you know, millionaires and have six pack abs. Like there's a reason that not everyone has all these things because it requires a lot of work and, you know, dedication and, and all this stuff. So yeah, you, you nailed it. It's like, yeah, you fix that leak, but then, you know, maybe it causes, you know, your ship now turns a little bit and then you got to steer it back on course. And so there's always something, but, uh, you know, I think that's why it takes, um, kind of a, a special person to be an entrepreneur because you don't really mind that. You just sort of know it's, it's part of the process. And, you know, one of, it's one of these things where, you know, failure is just kind of part of the process too. Like you're just, you're not always, not everything you do is going to be successful. And it's going to be a big hit and you just kind of, you know, take the bumps and bruises along the way and learn from it and hopefully get a little bit better. And that's kind of the whole mindset. And what's really cool, you know, now we've sort of transitioned into this app instead of selling digital products and files for the most part and uh, the best part about the app is it's like this it's like its own mechanism uh, organism I guess I should say and that you can always make it better and it's perfect because we're all into fitness we understand that lifestyle there's never an endpoint fitness right like you're always doing something there's always some way you can get better you can get faster you can get stronger you can grow more muscle you can get a little bit leaner whatever it is it's the same thing with the app like every month or two new features are added getting feedback from customers, from users. And they say, hey, you know, these three things are great, but have you thought about this? And I said, well, yes, we actually have thought about that. It just takes a long time to put that into practice or, you know, and make sure it works and all that. So that's the really cool part for me is like this continual gradual evolution over time where we just keep getting better and better and better and better and better. So you look back at six months ago, a year ago, you look at the product that you had and you're like, wow, that's not very good compared to what we have now. And so it's kind of like fitness, right? I mean, if I were to look back five years ago, I'd say, well, that's probably not a good analogy because I don't probably train as seriously as I used to. So five <laughs> years ago, I might've actually been better, but yeah, you get, you kind of get the idea, right? You look back and you're like, oh, wow, like, that wasn't that strong versus now. So, so how, I think something that um, RP is known for, at least whenever I hear it mentioned, is the fact that, and I, Mike mentioned this when we spoke, that you guys, your coaching team, everyone has a PhD. Is that correct? Uh, for the most part, uh, I think there's one or one or two coaches that might just have like a master's degree. Oh, um, just a master's yeah, degree. Right. Is a slipper. Yeah. <laughs> well, so in their defense, those folks, um, either have their, their RD license, so they're a registered dietitian, or, uh, the other example would be, he's also a professional bodybuilder. So it's kind of like, there's, there's usually some pretty, uh, good, still good quite, quality there. quite good. Like they've been to the gym before, certainly probably lifted bit, weights yeah. before all that sort of stuff so how do you how did you go about is that was that like we are only hiring people with phds or did that ha did that progress organically oh uh, yeah a little bit so the cool part was you know mike was going to school at east tennessee state which is like probably the top place in the country in the u.s for like sport physiology so they have a phd in sport physiology which is pretty rare and so he was going to school with all these people that had similar interests, right? And they're studying the same thing. And, you know, they had competed or, you know, cared about fitness themselves. And so he was able to make connections with them. And it's sort of like, hey, you know, while you're still in school or whatever, do you want to work as a coach and make some money on the side? And well, who's not going to want to do that? That's already in love with fitness. And so the idea was to get people that were highly qualified in terms of academics, but also really cared about the athletic part as well. And again, like, check check for people in a PhD program about sport physiology. So that was pretty easy. Uh, we really just got referrals from like people that we knew. And then um, let's see, so that was East Tennessee State. Then we had a couple coaches when, when Mike went to a different university. Uh, we pulled in a couple coaches from there. And just from there, it kind of almost grew from just like referrals. You know, if you run in the same circles where most people are PhDs or, you know, super highly qualified, you just know other people like that. And then, you know, well, let's get some registered dietitians and you know, like these aren't huge, huge groups, right? There's, there's only so many of these folks out there. And so it really just grew. I mean, actually now, even more recently, you know, a couple of our coaches are professors. And so, you know, they have students that are studying under them that eventually graduate. And then, you know, so like one, one lady had just reached out and was like, Hey, you know, I was a student of, you know, your, your coach and she's this resume she sent over, like she reached out to us. And you look at this resume and you're like, oh my gosh, this is ridiculous. I mean, it's way more qualified than I am, which is, you know, hilarious. Because, you know, it's like one of these things where like people ask to work for me personally. And I'm like, I got to be honest, I'm not even that good of a coach. So like, 
let our other coaches do it because they're going to be much better. Um, so it's just little things like that, or your students or referrals worked out really well for us. And every time you brought on a new coach, they just filled their spots. Like it sounds like the demand side for you has always just been there to fill. Yeah, the yeah, you know, a little bit. Um, maybe more recently, it's uh, kind of just been more steady. Uh, nothing too too crazy, but um, yeah, usually there's I would say a handful of people that reach out per year. It's just wow, these people are so highly qualified, and it's like if we have the need, then great. You know, let's sort of interview them and, and kind of you know get them get them onboarded or whatnot. And we have a coach, so one or two coaches that help onboard all of our new coaches, just so everyone's familiar and on the same page. And, you know, 95, 99% of the time, you know, our coaches are on the same page, but you know, it's not like 100% unanimous. Like you want a little sort of dissenting thoughts in there. You don't want everyone that's like a robot and says, Hey, we must do this. It's like, well, no, there's always a little bit of wiggle room in there. So now that you've, you've kind of transitioned your role, when you started, you were coaching people, then creating the templates, then hiring the managerial role and overseeing these different kind of moving parts. What does your day look like at this stage? Yeah. So in terms of like working, you know, normally usually get up, crank out whatever the emails catch up on anything overnight or, you know, I've actually become maybe just slightly more relaxed on the email front where sometimes late at night, I'm just not going to reply to emails unless it's like super, super urgent. It's like, you know, if I reply at, you know, eight in the morning versus you know, 10 o'clock at night, is that really going to make too much of a difference? That being said, are there exceptions to that 100%? It's super urgent or super, super important. Yes, I will absolutely do it. But it's like, I've sort of grown over time and you need to do that for so long. And you're just like, you know, don't want to get too burnt out. Cause I definitely, if we just kind of circle back to like 2015, 2016, that was like, point we were almost getting to burnout because you're just working literally so long so many hours and just each day kind of becomes a blur they all become intertwined you know no matter what day it was holidays it doesn't matter like we were working yeah so johnny described that as like when you you're on a treadmill and someone presses the the speed button more and more and you're just like absolutely trying to scramble to stay on it and if you stop the sense is like you're just never going to be able to catch up and you're in the wall (laughs) Yeah. For sure. You can't stop because then it's like, you know, let's say you do 50 emails a day. I'm just making that number up, but you know, you want to take a day off. Okay, cool. Well, now you come back, you have a hundred emails. Yeah. <laughs> well, now well, do you want to do that? No. So you want to kind of try to stay on top of it. And that's the really tricky part, especially early on, because you have to, you know, have some foresight to sort of overcome that and be able to like take a step back and be like, okay, well, I, I know that, yeah, I might get a little overwhelmed, but to, do more stuff and to be more successful long-term, I need to take that step back because I need to bring in more people to help because otherwise, you know, it's like being in this rat race where you're on a gerbil, gerbil wheel or whatever, and you just, you're, you're spinning in place. And it's like, unless you take a little time to step out of that, it's really hard. So that was a really long-winded way to say that I answer emails in the morning, I guess. So <laughs> uh, that's what I do. And then usually, you know, in the afternoons, I usually uh, make that time to, uh, so emails early in the morning, then I usually lift like late morning afternoons. I usually uh, set that side, uh, set that time aside to do you know, podcasts or, you know, phone calls or whatever it is, you know, meetings. We don't have a ton of meetings. That's kind of the one thing about RP, you know, talking to some of our app guys, they're like, yeah, we used to work at companies where we'd have like 20 meetings a week. You're like 20 meetings a week. I asked them, this wasn't too long ago. I said, how many of those are actually needed? He said, none. Like, what a complete waste of time. It's like, we're just not going to do that. Like, if you're not working, like, if you're going to work, just get what you need to get done, whatever that is, because we all work remotely, but just like, you get shit done. That's totally cool. Do it on your own time, schedule, pace, but as long as we are getting stuff done, we're not going to have these dumb meetings just to have meetings, just to kind of get on and say, oh, hey, hey, Sally, hey, Joe, what's up? And it's like, you know, 20 minutes of just yakking about nothing. It's like, well, I could have been, you know, doing stuff with my kids or, you know, cooking some food, like whatever it is. Just like, there's no need for it. So that's kind of like a, a rough day, kind of what I do now. So is that, I mean, I, I think people will, will hear that and think, wow, like Nick from RP just does like emails and podcasting. That sounds pretty good. Because I think if you, if you think sort of someone's starting at the very beginning, they're doing emails, podcasting, clients, like dealing with 
problems with people getting access to something, managing their marketing, managing everything. Is that because like only the most important emails cross your desk or are you like um, head of email? You know, I was uh, just trying to give the, the short view of that. So intertwined in all that, it's like, if anything pops up, you know, there's always stuff going on on, you know, Slack channels or, you know, texting people, being involved on social media a little bit, um, you know, kind of putting out fires here and there if stuff pops up. But yeah, you know, like we've got people that are, you know, handling most of that stuff, handling customer service requests, um, you know, all that. So it's like, again, those, you know, let, let smart people do what they're good at, you know, give them some autonomy and, you know, again, as long as you're sort of heading in the right direction, you don't have to micromanage. I've just, I've never been big on that, uh, nor do I think I'd be very good at that because people think, why, why do you want to do it this way? I mean, I don't know. It's usually how I do it. And they're like, that way sucks. Like, wait, let's do something else. And I'd be like, oh, okay, cool. Like, that's kind of how I view it. As long as um, people are able to get stuff done and it works, um, cool. Like, I'm, you know, I don't have this some huge ego where I'm like, hey, you have to do it this way. It's like, if you got a better way, I'd be stupid to, you know, not let you do it that way. So. I think getting your ego out of the way is something that a lot of people struggle with. Um, but it means, so the, the biggest lesson actually for me that kind of taught me this is trading. So trading indices and uh, Forex and so on, because if you're wrong and you're just digging your heels in and holding on to your opinion, when the market is telling you that you're wrong, the only person that pays the price is you because then you just go into more and more of a loss. And so it's, I think like, it's interesting to see someone of your level of advancement and seniority in business that is saying, look, I hold opinions lightly here because I can, you know, th there are people that, know how to do this stuff better and it seems like your role at this point is now kind of just rooting those people to the right places yeah hopefully again we've got a lot of smart people uh what, what's the quote you never want to be the smartest person in the room <laughs> that's never been a problem for me at rp because it's like we got phd coaches everywhere um i can't wait till we have our next summit because i'm going to make that joke as part of like the opening um you know, segue or whatever, when, when I introduce the, the summer or whatever, when the world's maybe back to normal next year or something. But they'll have all listened to yeah. this podcast. So they'll be like, oh, we've heard that one before. And, yeah, uh... totally. Well, you know, <laughs> if that's the case, I'm still going to make it even if no one laughs. Um, yeah, it's never, it's never been like that. Even Mike, you know, again, he's the smartest person I know, but um, he's kind of the same way. It's just like, well, yeah, I'm going to have an opinion on it, but if it's the best thing great if it's not then well it's just stupid to you know put your foot in the ground and, and stand you know steady with it it's like, no you got to be a little flexible and you know again we, we had something the other day i think it was, what, it was yesterday or, or monday but we had a call with like five or six people on it and you know someone threw out an idea that i had never really even thought of before and i was like hmm, well that's a pretty good idea and then we all got on the call and then the consensus was like, well, that's actually not maybe a good idea. Like, let's actually go a little bit different direction. I was like, I'm cool with that too. <laughs> well, so when, when you're doing this and when you're weighing up these different inputs and ideas, what are the KPIs that you focus on? Yeah, that's a good one. So it's kind of sh shifted a little bit over time because now we have the app and it's like a subscription model. So really it's like, well, you know, how do we, how do we take the feedback? So a lot of it was looking at ratings and reviews and feedback. And like our, our we have a giant Facebook group. So people, it, it's, you know, good and bad, of course, people can give lots of feedback. That's good. But also if, you know, one person doesn't like one aspect of your app and they voice it publicly, well, it might be, you know, three people out of, let's say 10,000 don't like it, but because they're voicing their opinions on it, it's almost like you, you see you get biased because that's what you see. So it's like the availability bias, right? It's like, maybe you're thinking about using the app and then you read this one review, but like maybe one other person comments on there too. And they're like, oh, wow, like well, these two people don't like this one part of the app. Like maybe it's not that great. So we're really big on the, you know, ratings and reviews and getting feedback. I'd, honestly, I would say that's really important right now because we want to know what, what our members and what our users want, what they like, maybe what they don't like. Um, new features that they want honestly i would say that's one of the biggest ones right now because because it's the app and it's you know membership model and like we want people like we want to help people and if we're only going to do that by sort of giving people what they want listening to their feedback that was something that um mike said about you which is that you've always had 
from the beginning, this relentless customer focus and making sure that the customers are happy because at the end of the day, that's what's going to cause the most referrals. And it seems to be a common trend that we're seeing with a lot of the CEOs that we've been chatting to, that they're all, no matter the kind of how rarefied they've become in their company, they're still very much focused on the customer experience. Yeah, totally. Because I mean, what is business without people that are using your stuff? It's, you, you don't really have anything in, I mean, if you want to talk about biases and, and things like that, you know, we have uh, negativity biases, right? So we can see 99 good reviews when we see one bad review. Well, which one's going to stick yeah, out? In your head? Exactly. <laughs> I'm going to be, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be obsessed about that one bad review. And I'm going to think, well, that really ticks me off. Like, I don't, you know, you don't want to see bad reviews, but you know, it's, it's, it's fair there. enough because when you're on Amazon as well, like, you know, as a customer, yeah. you're still like, oh, but what if that person's right? Even though, as you said, like, it's going to, like, most people are going to be happy, who are happy with the product, don't stop to leave a review because they're like, well, yeah, it was mm. fine. Like, it did, did what I needed it to. So it's only if you're pissed off that you then go against the grain and you actually. <laughs> so I've heard Tim Ferriss talk about um, when he's trying to appraise a product, he filters out the five stars and the one stars because they're people that are too evangelical and they're not objective. And he looks at the highest rated three and four star reviews because they're going to be a bit more reasonable and weighing up the pros and cons of the product. Yeah, it's really interesting. So it's like our app, you know, we, we sort of state like, hey, if you're if you work night shifts, it's just not set up for you right now. And very soon it is going to be. But you look through the reviews and if you sort through all the one star reviews, it's like 60% people that are like, this doesn't work for night shift. And you're like, <laughs> we told you that. Like that's literally in the app store description. Like we said it right there. It said, folks, it does not work for night shift users. Like, you know, it's just one of those things that goes back to people don't really, um, you know, care, care to read. But it's just like, you know, imagine that. Like, we got a 4.6 rating with, you know, like, I want to say about 10,000 reviews or something. So it's like a very, very good app. But it's like, man, you get rid of some of those that are just nonsensical. And we're at like 4.748. So it was really encouraging. But it also, it really is, is humbling because actually, you know, I, I will say on the Tim Ferriss front, the best reviews are the ones that, you know, maybe they'll give you four stars. Obviously, well, actually the best ones, they give you five stars, but they also give you critical feedback. And they're like, Hey, these three things were great. You know, maybe you can add, you know, these other two things. And you're like, yes, I salute you, sir, or ma'am, whoever you are, like, thank you for actually, you know, giving very useful feedback because that you can take in. Again, we have like big long lists of, you know, all the features and stuff that we want to add. And then we kind of sit around and, Know, prioritize things in terms of timelines and schedules and whatnot but um, yeah it's, it's really useful and you know Mike would probably even say that I'm maybe too obsessive about like you know re reviews and all that stuff which I don't know just want everyone to think RP is the greatest thing in the world right like it's it's RP is my baby you know it's what I've been doing for you know almost a decade now. So. How do you decide what so I suppose if we take it kind of a step back and make it more applicable to someone who's running a <clears throat> an online fitness business that doesn't have an app yet. They aren't quite the giant octopus. They're maybe a, a little mini octopus. And they're thinking, well, I run this service. It's using some software, you know, things like Zoom or perhaps a, an app that they've they manage their clients in. And clients come through and they say, I'd like the following or um, like I would change your service in this way. Or, you know, people always want, I feel like everyone always wants the most contact and the best service for the least money, right? Like that's just human nature. How do you know, or how do you appraise like what is and isn't important when it comes to building out your service in RP or your services? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, you know, so you're going to get some good feedback, some not so good feedback. And I think if you just it's almost like if you start seeing themes that continually emerge, like if a hundred people say, Hey, I loved this, but I don't like this. Well, then you probably know that this thing that most people didn't like, you got to do something about it. Um, and there's almost always something, right? Because nothing's ever perfect. At least most of the time, not, nothing's going to be perfect. Like you can always get, get a little bit better at something. Um, but then some of it also is just like, what's realistic in terms of, timeline schedules and budgets because you know let's say you're a smaller business and people are like oh you know you should you know have your own app and you're like okay <laughs> thank you but you know unfortunately i don't have you know half a million dollars sitting around and you know three years to invest in software development so it's like 
yeah, people might want that, but is it realistic? And you know, maybe just kind of setting those expectations up front with your own users or members being, hey, you know, I totally hear you, but you know, that's not super realistic for, you know, following reasons. And I think most people would be pretty cool with that if you're just really honest and upfront with them. So on, on that note then, let's say you were starting RP again and you haven't got the human capital, the physical capital and the, and the cash to be able to kind of um, quick start to where you are now, what would be your advice to your former self? Well, I guess some of it would be the exact same. Uh, some of it would change a little bit. First and foremost, do a good job. You know, have a product or service that works. It's the most important part because even with the best marketing in the world, if you just have a product that sucks, you know, it's eventually it's going to catch up to you. So you have to do a good job. And again, because you do a good job, you're probably going to get lots of referrals. You're going to get, you know, help one person lose weight, they know 10 other people, they're going to refer a handful of those friends. And now you got three, four or five clients and just sort of continually expands from there. So do a good job, provide good service, super, super important. You can't treat people like crap and, you know, blow them off and they pay you and then you vanish for days or weeks. Like be just very consistent with how and when you communicate with folks, be very prompt and on time. Like those are the same things that I would tell myself, you know, a decade ago, like, those are just the fundamentals. And I don't think those will ever change. You know, uh, one other thing that I would probably tell myself now going back, you know, into like 2016, I would say, hey, whatever timeline you think software development is going to take, expect about double that. Uh, that's probably the other one. That so be- rule, rule one, do a good job. Rule two, extend your expectations. I think with, with doing a good job, like people, it's easy for people to lose sight of that, I think, especially with all of the kind of, marketing advice online people forget that they actually have to deliver a service at the end of all this and getting loads of people on the front end and then just disappearing as you said it it's surprisingly common and i i see post after post of people referring to say some influencer that they signed up for a coaching service with and then just didn't they got ghosted they just (laughs) didn't hear back from them and you think well this is so damaging because once you've got a few of them going like that's that, that's that's your business as you said it's your stamp and it's very hard to recover from that yeah because at the end of the day it's that sort of grounds your your reputation and so again like we had a good product now again it's evolved over time of course but even the original excel diet templates that we had like, they worked they just got people results and they didn't i mean it's not like they came out of the gate as this massive success they did okay when we released them, but it was actually three months later when, you know, I think we had sold like a thousand of them and we were like, wow, this is so cool. Like this is the greatest thing in the world. And then people started posting the results and we had like a little mini sale to go along with it. And that's like, that's when it really started to blow up a little bit because people are like, oh, wow, I can spend a hundred dollars on this and I can still get really good results. You know, I can, I can lose weight. I can get jacked. And I can get stronger. People are like, this, this is crazy. And instead of paying, you know, four or five, six hundred dollars, they were paying a hundred dollars. People are like, wow, this is really cool. So it's again, like, you know, that, how do you manage your, your brand and your, your, your reputation? Well, like if you're just ghosting people, you're not in it for the long term. And that's maybe another thing that I would say. So if you want to go back to maybe add like a third part, well, fourth, if we count the app stuff, that's partly a joke, partly not. But um, <laughs> I would say four, you, you got to think long term. So if you're only chasing the short term, you want a quick fix or you want kind of the, you know, impulse society uh, mindset. Yeah, you're, you're not in it to, to win it long term. You're just in it to make a few bucks and then just kind of be on your merry way. But if you really care, you want to be around for years to come, you're going to do a good job. You're going to do what's required. You're going to treat people right. You're going to give them good service, all that stuff. Nice. <laughs> See, that, <laughs> I'm just letting that sink in. That's the opposite of the previous Zoom problem where both people try and speak at once. It's when both people don't try to speak at once and then it's... <laughs> really awkward yeah. and rubbish yeah totally yeah i've seen um you know some like uh spoof videos of like zoom calls and it's just like you know five minutes of just people say, oh, eh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh it's just our life <laughs> no, every, you know here, that's the thing man everyone's used to it even on um you know, some of our uh, zoom calls or whatever like my kids have popped into a couple of them like no one really cares now everyone's just like 
I mean, that guy became know. famous from it, didn't he? When it, the the correspondent who his kids started coming in, oh, he's trying man. like just. <laughs> I love that video. It's the yeah. way that it's the way his kids going like this in the background. I just it's just perfect. It's and like, he's, he's literally just like, <laughs> like trying not to pay attention, but just like push him off. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I don't even know how old that kid is. Man, but... Perfect. Like yeah, that's like, a career career starting decision from the kid. I think. Yeah, totally. Man, a year ago, yeah, people were like, "No, no, like you can't come in or whatever." Now it's just like whatever come in yeah join the you know, sit on my lap whatever you got like six kids sitting around like you know, no one cares anymore it's just like whatever you know? just part of the part of the work from home work from home lifestyle for sure so what so i think the a question that we are asked by people who are starting in the online world is i think people see businesses that are kind of i mean like rp now is you know you're involved with some pretty big names like across loads of different industries, right? Across loads of different sectors of the fitness industry. There's a lot of big names are associated with the brand, but people get confused when they shrink that down and think like, what's the, what's the thing I can do today as my first action to try and get someone to notice me? Is there anything that when you think back to RP, when it comes to like making your first sale, anything you can think of as being the thing you did or something that, that you both did to, to, to start that? Yeah. I mean, some of it goes, what we were just talking about, like, what would you tell yourself a while ago? Well, again, just like do a good job, right? Because I mean, if you just do a good job and you're like consistently posting, you know, awesome before and afters, or you have awesome testimonials, you know, sooner or later, again, and it's, you know, maybe you don't start reaching out to people with, you know, a couple million followers because they're probably getting hit up all the time. But you start with, you know, someone that's got a couple thousand followers and you do a good job with them, right? And you just sort of go from there and, you know, like, hey, you know, I'll help you out for free or whatever. You know, once you get really good results, will you write me a review or, you know, post it before and after? So, okay, cool. Most people are probably going to do that, if, you know, especially if you do a good job. And then, well, now maybe you reach out to someone with, you know, three, four, 5K followers. You do a good job with them. It's like, well, then maybe you start to reach out with someone with like 10, you know, like something like that. It's just like this okay. gradual progression over time. I don't think it's anything too crazy because here's – Honestly, at the end of the day, yeah, all right? So people want to go from zero to 100 overnight. I want to do that. I want to be as big as Facebook tomorrow. I want to be as big as my fitness pal tomorrow. I would love that. And maybe I wouldn't love that because it'd probably have like a million other issues like we were talking about earlier. Think of the emails. Yeah, yeah, think of the emails. I, <laughs> uh, uh, it's bad oh, enough, man. Horrendous. Like, I was like, totally, yeah. But it's like people want that. People want to... They want results as fast as possible. You guys know this, you're in the fitness space. You ever see someone that's like, yeah, you know, I want to like gain 10 pounds of muscle, but I want to do it over like the next two years. <laughs> People are like, yeah, I want to gain 10 pounds of muscle, but like, can I do it by, you know, next Thursday? And you're like, no, you can't. Sorry, it doesn't work like that. So again, it's just having reasonable expectations about what it takes to be successful. It doesn't happen overnight. You know, it's like, yeah, people kind of say that now. They're like, oh, you know, like RP is really successful. Yeah, but that's because you don't know in 2012, 2013, 2014, we were doing nothing. No one cared about us. No one knew who we were. And it's like, you know, then we got just a little bit of success. And then it kind of builds upon itself. So again, just keep doing a good job consistently over time. And, you know, just like year after year after year after year after year of doing a really good, really good job, then you can start to make a difference. But it's not going to happen overnight. And I think a lot of people lose sight of that. Because, you know, social media and, and everything likes to promote that. It's like, hey, do you want to make a million dollars? Yes. <laughs> do you want to do that by next week? Yes. You know, they're like, is that realistic? No, it's not realistic. So, again, I, social media is good and bad, but I think it just really kind of twists and distorts people's perceptions about, you know, what it actually takes to be successful. I suppose sometimes the slow way is the fast way. And... Yeah, you know, we we've definitely made this mistake early on in our fitness journey. Johnny and I tried every bloody fad and stupid diet and training program over the years until we realised that oh, actually, if we just get our heads down and just do progressive overload and calorie deficit and you know then a, a very sensible calorie input over years and stay injury free, that it's not a very sexy tagline, but that yeah. is faster <laughs> than spending two years jumping between fads that don't work. And I think the same applies very much with marketing tactics and um, 
growth hacks and those kind of things too. I can't agree with that anymore. I mean, that's just, it's literally, that is the perfect way to sum things up. You want the secret? Here's the secret. You work your ass off for years upon years doing things kind of a slow, unsexy way, but that's what gradually builds up progress over time. Again, six months from where you were, you look back and you go, I I made some progress. And then a year from now, you just keep doing the same thing and it slowly builds over time. I think there's like a Warren Buffett quote that's, um, you know, someone was like, why doesn't everyone invest like you? And he's like, no one wants to get rich slowly. Everyone wants to get rich quick. Well, shoot, like you said, you're not the first person to think of that. But again, do do people have the patience? Do they have, you know, can they ditch their ego where, you know, they can spend three years, um, you know, what is it? Like, I'm not the the best at all these quotes. I don't necessarily follow all these people a ton, but, you know, like even Gary Vanderchuk was like, you know, you have to like swim in a pile of shit for years before like, you know, really anything good happens to you. People don't want to do that because you don't really see that. Usually what you see is just like, you know, the, the glamour life or whatever, but it's like, that's really, yeah. You don't see the five years where they spent doing nothing out of sight. Like you miss that whole part. So you're only seeing the highlight story. Then you get the power of compound interest as well. I mean, you, you guys have, well, you've hit half a million followers now. That is insane. And but, but whereas now I'm sure you found that and, you know, our, our friend Chris on uh, Modern Wisdom has had the similar kind of growth where it's like, it took him two years to get to 20,000 subscribers, which is it's still pretty decent, but then it took him two months to get to 30 and two weeks to get to 40. So once, you know, yeah, that is swimming in the pot of shit for a while, but then once you start to get out of it, you, you then really fly. So that is the really, really interesting part. And I'm sort of obsessed with reading about and sort of figuring out like what makes some people successful more than others. And there's a handful of variables. But one of these variables in there, um, I forget the name of the book, but it's kind of like the, the laws of success or something like that. It's a yellow book that covers yellow. It's written by a you know, like PhD guy and they basically studies success and you know, like network models and things like that. And one of the rules in that book sort of fits um, you know, Robert Cialdini influence, the idea of social proof. So you can do a really great job, but if people don't know about it, really doesn't mean all that much but what happens is you start to get a little bit of success and success builds upon success over time and what happens is like you you, these things work together like that because uh, what you know what's like a good example um it's like the music cloud uh study or something that they did and this is a few years ago but they basically showed that they could rank things um they could basically influence how people voted for their favorite song. Because if they went in and they set up studies to show this, but they would have some of the songs already sort of pre-selected, like, hey, here was like the three most popular ones. And then they would switch all the stuff around for other groups and they would not show any favorites or anything like that. And then like the rankings would be totally different. So if you already kind of know, it's like, you know, the top 40 billboard or whatever. Well, if it's like the number one song in the world, everyone's gonna listen to it for the most part. If you're like number 50 or, you know, not in the top hundred or whatever, it's like, you know, hit or miss if people kind of care about it. But like once you have that success and you start moving that way, you know, it's just just social proof, right? So we can't know everything. So what are we going to do? We're going to look to other people to see what they're doing and, 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 you know, things that they like, people that they think are, you know, really helpful. And it's like, you start to get that and it just really starts to build. And that's how you get, you know, these sort of exponential outliers that just outpace everyone that are just impossible to catch as well once they've started yeah. in that direction. Yeah, because we, we've seen that recently with our YouTube channel. You know, Mike started pouring a lot of content into that. And like six weeks ago, I mean, we were like maybe like 60K subscribers, something to like 90 now. It's just like, you know, one video just like started to take off. It was a video of Ethan uh, Supli. I don't know if you guys, do you know who that is? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he used to play like, you know, he was like the the you know 500 pound guy and remember the titans it's an like awesome movie mm. and um you know now he's like 250 in like really good shape and super serious about training and so it's like yeah that video like went over a million views on our youtube channel like became this outlier it's just like well again if you have one really popular video most people are going to go to that it's, it's how it works and then that's like the the door into your world right like people 
there's the common ground. Like, oh, I know who that is. That, that that's a that's a famous guy. Like, oh, that's interesting. And then suddenly, I'm in the world of RP, and there's all this other stuff to consume. But yeah, it's I think that that problem is something that, or I, I think people look at that and think, ah, oh, it's easy for them. They had a viral video, right? Or like, it's easy for him. He's got a million followers. But they they forget about well. I wonder what the process was to get from not yeah. having that to having that. Like that's what creates the the outcome. Totally. I mean, I all look around at people that have a couple million followers. I'm just like, what? Like, I, just, I don't get it. Um, but yeah, you just it's just how everyone is, right? We just we have our own biases and we look at things and you know we want to sort of negate what other people have done and you know always try to build ourselves up or whatever. But um, yeah, you know, well, I'm sure they did. They worked a lot to get to where they are and mm. I can't sort of forget that I see I've seen on your Instagram that you're quite big into reading about discipline and willpower and uh, I guess behavior as part of that as well is there any of that do you use any of that stuff in your own day-to-day when it comes to sort of managing your behaviors managing the decisions you make yeah yeah totally so you asked about like a sample day um I, I I've had a couple like little nagging injuries recently so I've been easing off a little on that and, you know, kind of sleeping in a little bit more, just kind of hoping that would help me recover quicker. Um, but yeah, for quite some time, I was pretty adamant about getting up pretty early and I would do a little bit of cardio, usually like rowing, uh, maybe a little bit of running or just like incline walking just to do something. And then I would read in the morning. Um, and definitely, man, the, the cool thing about, you know, just learning about discipline is usually the people that have the most discipline, you know, they have that or they have the most willpower seemingly because they basically build in habits where they don't really have to truly use their willpower. It's just like the best example that I can possibly give is if you have junk food in your house. I don't care who you are. Maybe if you're like a hardcore bodybuilder a couple of weeks out from a show, you can overcome that. But if you're like a normal person and you have junk food in the house and you're trying to diet, like, are you going to eat that junk food at some point? Probably. Like, yeah. I don't care who you are. Like, again, like I like to think I have high levels of discipline and motivation, willpower, whatever you want to call it. But, like I'm susceptible to that. Golden double stuff Oreos are my nemesis. Mm. And it's just like, you, if you build in the habits, you don't even have that stuff or it's like sort of out of sight, out of mind. That's how you can start to overcome that stuff. So again, like, but discipline is super huge if you want to talk about successful people. So in the business, you know, there was like a couple of years straight where my wife and I never went to bed without answering every single email. If you want to go back to like that, 2015, 2016. Now, part of that led to some of the little burnout over time, but it's like, it's that discipline. It's that dedication, consistency over time, where people might want to slack here and there. We didn't do that. We did not do that. So it's again, you just start to establish your brand and your reputation. Like, hey, they're always going to respond on time. People love that. You do a good job. You know, don't treat them wrong. And it's like, that just slowly builds the foundation on which more success can be built. That's awesome, man. That, that having like having rules like that, that you just never waver from. T- it really takes a lot. Yeah. yeah. I don't do that anymore. You know, like I said, I'm a little bit more relaxed, but uh, yeah, we're very good, man. Um, you know, our, our director of customer service, you know, send me some stuff like our average response time. And now again, this like includes overnight, right? Where like, you know, no one's on answering. Like, our average response time is like 50 minutes. Right. So if you take out overnight, I mean, it's probably under 30 minutes, which is like pretty wild, right? Like that's, that's pretty immediate. You're getting a reply. So is that people like submitting a support ticket in the app? I'm guessing. Uh, yeah. Or just reaching out through our website. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's people who are like paying you in some way. They have a query or a problem yeah. in general. They hear well, but, you know, you. like some sort of problem or issue, you know, maybe they don't understand something and they can't find you know something or they just have general, uh, they're inquiring about what RP is or, you know, how we can help or whatever. And so again, it's like being very responsive. Um, that level of kind of like OCD-ness is, is what our Instagram page does too. Like we respond to every single message, tag, whatever. Yeah. I, so I, I was quite impressed with, so I, I tagged RP and yourself on the story and I, I was thinking, oh, like they're going to be pounded with people tagging them in the story and stuff like that. They're not going to respond. And you, you, Mike, and RP did. And I was like, oh, God. Oh, whoa. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they must be sifting through messages at a hell of a rate. Like, we have a friend who's, he's got 100,000 followers. And his Instagram inbox makes me want to be sick. Like, 
it's it's ridiculous so i can't even imagine um having like a high traffic um thing of like 500k yeah man uh listen you know people you know always want to be like hey i want to be you know successful <laughs> you're like no and your it, inbox will be terrible it'll be really stressful <laughs> yeah <laughs> but then i sort of sometimes i'll flip it back to them and you want to be a millionaire whatever you want six pack abs everyone thinks that they want that they think that it's easy to say that when you don't have to put in the work to do that you're like yeah i want to be a billionaire i want to you know drive six ferraris at once whatever whatever and it's like yeah i want six pack abs and you know like veins all over because like that's cool it's like then you really tell people what it takes really tell them what it takes right, now do you really want that and most people are like oh uh yeah no i don't really Okay, well, there's a reason that some people do that. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, why they don't. It's like, you just don't understand how much it works, to take, how much work it takes to get there. And for some people, they are willing to pay that price and they have no issues with that whatsoever. But a lot of people are just going to make, yeah, you know what? I'm okay with that trade-off where I'm not going to take that risk. I'm going to, you know, enjoy things a little bit more or whatever. And that's totally cool, right? Like, people get to make their own choices in life. That's kind of the, the beauty of, of life, right? But, it's a really so. interesting point. Like that's the, the trade-off and people aren't always willing to pay the price for what, and also even um, realizing what the benefit that they're actually aiming for is. So I don't know if you've seen that meme that is so painfully true. I just can't, it, where it's like um, expectation and it's like you, you bench press and lift weights and then you get loads of like female attention and reality is just a bunch of men that are just like, how much you bench, bro, how much creatine you take, like all this kind of stuff. And it's, it's like, totally. yeah, like people think that, oh, if I start lifting weights, I'm going to get more female attention. It's like, no, no, you're going to get more male attention from a very specific niche of men that, uh, yeah. So like knowing that this is actually what I want and I'm willing to accept the price of that. So oh, yeah. we've, um, I realize you've, you've got to wrap up soon, Nick. I just had a couple of things that I really wanted to, to ask you. And I suppose you've kind of answered some of this, which is the, the guiding principles behind your behavior and your daily habits. Um, and that's kind of been what you said about extending your expectations, recognizing that um, success comes at a price, playing the long game and doing a good job. For people who are starting out, are there any kind of key habits that someone who's a new PT needs to develop early on? Devour as much information as you can get. Always have the mindset where you can always get better. You never know everything. There's always something you can do to get better, to improve upon it. I don't care what it is. It's your own personal health. It's your own personal knowledge. So again, real quick side story going back to like 2015, 2016, even 2017. Um, I honestly, I, I kind of lost that mindset for a while because I was so involved with working in RP that I almost, I, I had sort of a little bit of an ego where I was like, oh, you know, I don't need to like, watch you know videos on like how to do things better and it's like i look back now and i want to punch myself in the face for thinking that i'm not even kidding and it was i had a hernia surgery and i couldn't train for a few months and i started walking and listening to audiobooks and that got me back on this right track of like i just i had this like epiphany where i was like i'm learning right now while walking I'm like, why haven't i been doing this the entire time i would start making notes and you know, I didn't think anything of it, but I just kept doing this. I kept taking notes from reading all these different books. And then like a year later, I started to have all these like common themes and trends that were emerging. And I was like, okay, again, going back to like my obsession with like what makes people successful and what makes other people not successful. Well, I had like all these key themes that I kept seeing. And it wasn't like just one genre. It was just like all these different genres. And it just kept pointing in the same direction. It's like, you want to be successful. It's going to take like these, these handful of things. And then, you know, the coronavirus hit and I was like, now I have more time. I'm, like, I'm going to write a book on this. And so it was like this accumulation period of like a year and a half of kind of reading and making all these notes and whatever. But then I put it all into an outline. And then over the course of a couple of months of the coronavirus, you know, literally being quarantined in my house. Uh, yeah, I wrote the rough draft for it. So oh, uh, nice. Looking go. forward to seeing that. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully, I, ho I hope people like it. I think it maybe will, will have some pretty good value for folks. And um, yeah, like it relates to dieting, it relates to, you know, business entrepreneurs, like if you can do all these things, like you're, you're, 
success sort of depends each person their success their definition of is going to vary quite a bit but i think if you do all these common things like you are going to be successful there's almost no way around it oh it's cool um and yeah like the, there's definitely the realization of like ah oh, bollocks i wish i'd been doing this five years ago and totally. um i'm so glad that that we you know i think lifting is one of one of the the biggest and best decisions that we could have made at the age of 16 like a 16 year old you're an idiot yeah, like boy. you know nothing so so actually getting into that early on was such because you see people now at like 25 30 35 that they're starting now and it's like and they're aware that they've missed this window yeah that would have been and, and would have compounded so much if they just started earlier um but yeah well so i have a really good example of that too so about a year ago yeah about a year ago i started training jiu-jitsu for the first time ever i'd never done it before never no martial arts no like grappling wrestling background ever but um you know some our other rp coaches do it and, and whatnot and they love it and i was like okay it's kind of this new challenge and whatnot and it's i wish i would have started five or ten years ago because i got pretty into it and i mean now i don't do it quite so much because i you know quarantine and all that stuff i can't really do it it's probably um, the least covid friendly sport that you could do isn't it <laughs> the least friendly for coronavirus <laughs> yes you're like literally have sweat like from another human being like basically all over your body yeah, no, it's just terrible for that but uh, it's like yeah man uh if I could give myself some advice five years ago, I'd be like, hey, start training jujitsu. Because again, it's so humbling. You can't have an ego. Uh, yeah, I'm like 215 pounds, like, you know, kind of a fairly strong, big dude. Most people would say that, you know, don't lift or whatever. And man, there's like these people that weigh 130. There's like girls that, you know, just can like tap me out in seconds. I'm just like, what's going on here? It's wild. That is mad. Um, the, the final thing I wanted to ask you about, and is just before we started recording with Nick, I asked him, <laughs> I was like, where are you based? And he's like, I'm in Carolina. I was like, oh, the, so the gyms must be opening again. And Nick was like, I don't know. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is fascinating because, so what, what he said was like, I'm just not following the news. Like I tune myself out of it. It's not useful information for me. I unfollow everything on Facebook. I'm away from the news. I'm just doing what I'm doing. Nick, can you talk to us about that? Yeah. So you want to talk about like key variables to success. One of them's uh, locus of control, right? So if you have an internal locus of control, you believe that what you do can have an outcome or can have an impact on your outcomes. So you are more likely to take action to get a specific outcome. If you have an external locus of control, you believe stuff happens to you. And you don't have much control over it. And you can imagine which one's going to set you up to do better overall? Do you believe that you are kind of a victim? Things happen to you. You have no control. Nothing you do is going to impact it. Well, that sort of leads you down the rabbit hole of you know, possible depression and things like that. And that sort of leads to the whole idea of positive psychology, which I, again, like another whole topic that I've recently found over like the last six months or a year. Um, but that's a really big one. And so like I watched it. Why would I watch the news? Can I make choices that are going to impact, uh, you know, policies in the U.S. or around me. No, I can't, nor would I want to. Like, why would anyone, anyone want to go into politics? I have no idea. Um, but it's like, I can't control that, so I'm just not going to waste my energy on it. Again, it's kind of the same with, like, debating random people on social media. Why do I want to do that? Most people are so biased that I could literally put, like, facts in front of them and they're just no it won't matter to them it's like well, why would i want to waste my time i want to focus on things that i can control that i have an impact on that are going to you know help rp help my family help myself that's where i'm going to spend my time i just i don't care to have all this negativity drawn in because what does that do to you no, it just puts you in a bad mindset it just it gets you kind of off track it gets i mean how many times i'm sure you guys have seen this before I'll like hop on my phone to do something. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I gotta like send this text. A notification pops up on my phone. Well, let me just check this. And then I see something else. And then literally 15 minutes go by. <laughs> I haven't done a damn thing. And I'm like, what did I get on my phone to do? It's just like, I don't wanna go down that rabbit hole. Now, do I do that sometimes? Yeah, of course, I'm human and we're all, you know, wired to, you know, 
I don't know, whatever, be, be impacted by some of that stuff. But it's just like, I'm just not going to allow all that negativity in because I just, I refuse to do it. And I'm going to be much better off for, for that reason. So do you have like Instagram on your phone, for example? Yes. I am you- far too heavily involved in Instagram that I can't take it off. Um, yeah, that's, that's probably my, my biggest downfall. I think, yeah, I think that's the struggle that we both, because both of us have this, this thought of like, we could just get a phone that does text and calls. And then you think, oh yeah, but, and there's, there's like 10 things on the yeah, but list of like, yeah, but I need that. I need this and the clients, this, I want to email you. And then before you know it, you kind of have this like thing that sits on your desk that, you know, if you look at it, that's half an hour gone. Like every time you pick it up half an hour gone without, without failure. Yeah, (laughs) totally. Is that, it sounds like that's something you're probably actively working on quite a lot to manage. A little bit. I, I will say that I used to have Facebook like right on the um, main screen on my phone. I did take that off. So if I want to go into Facebook, I have to like actively press several buttons to get in there. Um, I've also, and this is like not political at all, whether you're left, right, whatever, people posting all this stuff, man, I just uh, unfollow, unfollow, unfollow. <laughs> like, I, Susie Joe that I went to high school with, like, I don't really care what your opinion is, like, on mask or like, I'm just like, no, like, if I need to get out and do some work, great, I'll try to do that, you know, like, we have a big Facebook group, so I'm definitely, like, on Facebook a good amount, but it's just like, why do you want to waste so much, again, time is, like, our most precious resource, and you can just get sucked down that rabbit hole so easily for literally hours a day, accomplishing not too much good comes of it. And you start to look at research um, with, with younger kids and whatnot. So uh, Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, really cool dude, man. I love, love his readings. You know, he starts to talk about, you know, what's happening to uh, the iGen. So like kids that are kind of just getting into college or whatever now, or so they sort of grew up and they always had smartphones or always had internet. It's like, like what's happening with these kids it's like, well they're literally like glued to this thing 24 7 and it's just like i don't want my kids to do that we've actually got our kids off screens almost entirely over the whole like coronavirus quarantine thing which i think is really cool because like now they're playing with each other and they're like being creative and like doing you know actual stuff that we used to do as kids where, like you just like go outside and you know do stupid stuff or whatever you don't have a parent like hovering over you every five seconds that's an absolutely inhuman achievement to stop kids and screens especially when as you said like these things are engineered for addiction and kids have much less of a a filter and more impulsive so to be able to do that especially during quarantine when it's like there's nothing else to do that is well done for that i hope we can keep it up uh the the biggest thing you know I, i i did not have a cell phone until i went to college I don't think that was like too, too crazy. Um, Facebook didn't exist until I had graduated high school. So what I don't want to have happen is I don't want my kids when they're 10, 11, 12, whatever, especially my daughter, she's six now. So I have a few years before this is going to be a thing. I don't want them to be, especially in like the junior high years where like kids are just ruthless, right? I don't want them to get caught up in the whole social media thing. So right now my wife and I's tentative plan it's like not give them a smartphone until they're like 16. And it's like, you want a smartphone? Great, go get a job. You can help pay for it. Then if you can do one, you are 16. So maybe you're driving. Okay, it makes sense to have a phone. And two, you actually have a job. You actually have to help pay for it. Well, then if you, if it means that much to you, then cool. Then you, you might be able to, but it's just social media, man. It's, it's good, but man, it's bad too. Yeah, well, a friend of mine just got build $3,000 from Apple because her five-year-old son was uh, buying gems on some, <laughs> on some like little crap game. She was just like, Whoa. I don't so, think you can get refunds for stuff like that either. Like that's bought and done. Like that's. Sorry. You got the gems now. Game over, yeah. yeah. You can't get the gems yeah. back. Can you? Man. It's wild. But you're right, man, they are designed to be addictive. And so what's really interesting is I think there's like some high level Silicon Valley people who like don't let their kids even have it because they know. Mm. It's That's just like, so ominous, isn't it? Goodness oh me. man, are you kidding me? That would be like, like me not letting my family like, you know, eat kind of RP style. Like, oh, of course we all eat RP style. Like, you know, we're not like eating s- 
stupid stuff. No, we're like eating predominantly healthy food most of the time. Like, boy, that's wild. Sure. Nick, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much oh, for coming on. I, I hope so. Yeah, hopefully it's the, the PG-13 version. Of it will very much so. Yeah, very much so. We spoke a lot less about octopi. Octopi? Octopodes. Octopodes. It's a Greek oh, word. Is it? Yeah. You've definitely been looking that up recently, haven't you? <laughs> That's a recent thing for you. <laughs> Nick, if people want to find out more about you, where do they go? At RP Strength on Instagram. Yeah, just hit over 500K followers, which is pretty cool. Uh, pretty big accomplishment, I think. Um, There's a 20% so being... sale, if I remember correctly. Oh, it technically ends last oh, night. Oh, probably, oh, probably, so. probably, probably still open to about an hour or so. But, you know, of course, when this goes live, it'll probably be over. Otherwise, yeah, I probably would have said that. Um, or, you know, myself uh, at uh, nick.shaw.rp on Instagram. Awesome. Sweet. All right. Nick, thank you. Thanks for having me on, guys. Really appreciate it. Speak soon. See ya.